Moby Dick, by Herman Melville. Chapter 17. The Ramadan. As Queequeg's Ramadan, or fasting and humiliation, was to continue all day, I did not choose to disturb him till towards nightfall, for I cherished the greatest respect towards everybody's religious obligations, never mind how comical, and could not find it in my heart to undervalue even a congregation of ants worshipping a toadstool, or those other creatures in certain parts of our earth, who with a degree of footmanism quite unprecedented in other planets, bow down before the torso of a deceased landed proprietor merely on account of the inordinate possessions yet owned and rented in his name. I say, we good Presbyterian Christians should be charitable in these things, and not fancy ourselves so vastly superior to other mortals, pagans and what not, because of their half-crazy conceits on these subjects. There was Quiquug, now, certainly entertaining the most absurd notions about Yojo and his Ramadan. But what of that? Quiquug thought he knew what he was about, I suppose. He seemed to be content, and there let him rest. All our arguing with him would not avail. Let him be. I say, and heaven have mercy on us all, Presbyterians and pagans alike, for we are all somehow dreadfully cracked about the head, and sadly need mending. Towards evening, when I felt assured that all his performances and rituals must be over, I went up to his room and knocked at the door, but no answer. I tried to open it, but it was fastened inside. Quiquug, said I softly through the keyhole, all silent. I say, Quiquug. Why don't you speak? It's I, Ishmael. But I'll remain still as before. I began to grow alarmed. I had allowed him such abundant time. I thought he might have had an apoplectic fit. I looked through the keyhole, but the door opening into an odd corner of the room, the keyhole prospect was but a crooked and sinister one. I could only see part of the footboard of the bed and a line of the wall, but nothing more. I was surprised to behold resting against the wall the wooden shaft of Gwekeg's harpoon, which the landlady the evening previous had taken from him, before our mounting to the chamber. That's strange, thought I, but at any rate, since the harpoon stands yonder, and he seldom or never goes abroad without it, therefore he must be inside here, and no possible mistake. Quiquug! Quiquug! All still! Something must have happened! Apoplexy! I tried to burst open the door, but it stubbornly resisted. Running downstairs, I quickly stated my suspicions to the first person I met, the chambermaid. La! La! She cried. I thought something must be the matter. I went to make the bed after breakfast, and the door was locked, and not a mouse to be heard, and it's been just so silent ever since. But I thought, maybe, you had both gone off and locked your baggage in for safekeeping. La! La! Ma'am! Mistress! Murder! Mrs. Hussey! Apoplexy! And with these cries, she ran towards the kitchen, I following. Mrs. Hussey soon appeared, with a mustard pot in one hand and a vinegar cruet in the other, having just broken away from the occupation of attending to the casters, and scolding her little black boy meantime. Woodhouse! cried I, which way to it? Run for God's sake, and fetch something to pry open the door. The axe! The axe! He's had a stroke! depend upon it. And so saying I was unmethodically rushing upstairs again empty-handed, when Mrs. Hussey interposed the mustard pot and vinegar cruet, and the entire caster of her countenance. What's the matter with you, young man? Get the axe. For God's sake, run for the doctor, someone, while I pry it open. Look here, said the landlady quickly putting down the vinegar cruet, so as to have one hand free. Look here, are you talking about prying open any of my doors? And with that she seized my arm. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you, shipmate? In as calm, but rapid a manner as possible, 
I gave her to understand the whole case. Unconsciously clapping the vinegar cruet to one side of her nose, she ruminated for an instant, then exclaimed, No, I haven't seen it since I put it there. Running to a little closet under the landing of the stairs, she glanced in, and returning, told me that Gweekug's harpoon was missing. He's killed himself, she cried. It's unfortunate Stig's done over again there goes another counterpane. God pity his poor mother. It will be the ruin of my house. Has the poor lad a sister? Where's that girl? There, Betty, go to Snarls the painter, and tell him to paint me a sign, with, no suicides permitted here, and no smoking in the parlor. Might as well kill both birds at once. Kill? The Lord be merciful to his ghost. What's that noise there? You, young man, avast there. And running up after me, she caught me as I was again trying to force open the door. I don't allow it. I won't have my premises spoiled. Go for the locksmith, there's one about a mile from here. But a vest. Putting her hand in her side pocket, here's a key that'll fit, I guess. Let's see. And with that, she turned it in the lock, but, alas, Gweekug's supplemental bolt remained unwithdrawn within. Have to burst it open, said I, and was running down the entry a little, for a good start, when the landlady caught at me, again vowing I should not break down her premises, but I tore from her, and with a sudden bodily rush dashed myself full against the mark. With a prodigious noise the door flew open, and the knob slamming against the wall, sent the plaster to the ceiling, and there, good heavens, there sat Queekig altogether cool and self-collected, right in the middle of the room, squanting on his hams, and holding Yojo on top of his head. He looked neither one way nor the other way, but sat like a carved image with scarce a sign of active life. Queekoog, said I, going up to him, Queekoog, what's the matter with you? He hain't he been a-sitting so all day, has he? said the landlady. But all we said, not a word could we drag out of him. I almost felt like pushing him over, so as to change his position, for it was almost intolerable, it seemed so painfully and unnaturally constrained, especially, as in all probability he had been sitting so for upwards of eight or ten hours, going to without his regular meals. Mrs. Hussey, said I, he's alive at all events, so leave us, if you please and I will see to this strange affair myself. Closing the door upon the landlady, I endeavored to prevail upon Gweekeg to take a chair, but in vain. There he sat, and all he could do, for all my polite arts and blandishments, he would not move a peg, nor say a single word, nor even look at me, nor notice my presence in the slightest way. I wonder, thought I, if this can possibly be a part of his Ramadan, do they fast on their hands that way in his native island? It must be so, yes, it's part of his creed, I suppose. Well, then, let him rest. He'll get up sooner or later, no doubt. It can't last forever, thank God, and his Ramadan only comes once a year, and I don't believe it's very punctual then. I went down to supper. After sitting a long time listening to the long stories of some sailors who had just come from a plum pudding voyage, as they called it, that is, a short whaling voyage in a schooner or brig, confined to the north of the line, in the Atlantic Ocean only, after listening to these plum puddingers till nearly eleven o'clock, I went upstairs to go to bed, feeling quite sure by this time Gweekeg must certainly have brought his Ramadan to a termination. But no, there he was just where I had left him, he had not stirred an inch. I began to grow vexed with him, it seemed so downright senseless and insane to be sitting there all day and half the night on his hems in a cold room, holding a piece of wood on his head. For heaven's sake, Quakeug, get up and shake yourself, get up and have some supper. You'll starve, you'll kill yourself, Quakeug. But not a... Eh? 